So, Leia, how have you been this week? Uh, good. You've been playing any video games? Yeah. <laughs> so, to all of you, uh, this is a non Seamus diecast episode. It's not an official one. Uh, he had some other stuff he needed to get done, so I'm doing this with my daughter, Leia. Say hello, Leia. Hi. <laughs> so, what have you been playing, Leia? I've been playing Minecraft. Everyone's been playing Minecraft. It's It's been going on for years. When did you start, first start playing Minecraft? When I was four or something. Yeah. <laughs> You're pretty, I started playing Hexit. Pretty early. Oh, yeah. You, you played Hexit with mom. Yeah, and I like to crash the computer. Really? Yeah, I would crash the computer because I would, like, build all those, like, there were these building scripts, and I just used those, and then they made these huge towers, and I just oh. go, bah, 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 and <laughs> Just, like, slap them down one after another. So yeah. You're, you're like abusing the, the procedural tools, huh? Yep. Fun. Very fun. Yeah. It's been a while since I played Minecraft. Is it, is it uh, getting better or getting worse? or Getting better. They yeah. added staglomites. The caves are massive. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they did the, the caves and chasms update? Caves and cliffs. Cliffs. Hmm. Cool. And they're going to add the wild update. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Is it like new animals? Are they finally going to yeah. add like fish that you can catch? Well, they're going to add frogs and frogs? tadpoles. Okay. All right. And they're... It's a good start. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to add some new building material. Hmm. Like uh, more cosmetic stuff or like materials that are useful? Stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of cosmetic materials in Minecraft now. <laughs> yeah. I remember back in my day, there was only cobblestone. You couldn't even turn cobblestone back into normal stone. You could just build with cobblestone. That's all you could do. I'm going to put you... Do you like my giant cobblestone castle? Uh-huh. That's how it used to be. Um, I was watching one of Mumbo's videos, and apparently, you the only way you could get chain meal was by making it out of fire. Yes. Yeah. Can you get chain meal now normally? Uh-huh. Oh, no. Iron iron nuggets. Iron nuggets. Oh, okay. Smart. Oh, that's really cool. And I was also watching Mumbo's video when I found out that before, you didn't have the ordinary, like, hurt noises. You went, ooh, when you got hurt. Hmm. Interesting. So it's more of a, more of like a, a exclamation rather than... Yeah. Than that noise. Hmm. Interesting. Cool. So what are you looking forward to in Minecraft? You know, more cosmetics? I like, I like the cosmetic stuff. Like cosmetic hmm. and animals. And the warden is going to be amazing. Is it like a, a better stone golem or something? Or iron golem? No, it's got 200, uh-huh. 200, eight, no, 20, yeah. Is it, but I mean, like, is on your side or is it uh, like an enemy mob? It's an enemy. Oh, okay. But if you crouch and you can just sneak past, you could circle around it when you're crouching and it wouldn't notice you. Hmm. Oh, that's right. Because it's got, uh, it only senses sound. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So you're looking forward to fighting the warden? Yeah. Raising tadpoles? <laughs> yep. And building different colored, so, I mean, like, they got colored wool, right? Uh-huh. And they've got colored concrete, concrete and, ter- and, ter- and terracotta. Ter- so, like, what more cosmetics do you need? You've got colored materials. Like, okay. what are they adding? They're adding more wood, which I'm very excited about. More different types of wood? Yes. But I there's, think- like, already four different types of wood, isn't there? I think that, well, there's the acacia, the uh-huh. oak, the dark oak, the jungle, uh-huh. and the birch. Five. So, and like, then the why do you need more types of wood? And then the warped and the crimson. What? Are, and they're adding more even after that? Yeah. And it's going to be like, the planks are going to be an orangish red, red. Okay. So they don't have like any orangey color. I guess the jungle wood is kind of orange, isn't it? Yeah. A little bit. So it's just going to be like more like jungle wood. Is it yeah, just one type of wood or are they adding like a whole bunch one, of different types of wood? One type one of wood. One more type of wood. Okay. And then it's got, and it's going to be in between crimson and jungle. Hmm. All right. Cool. So. And they're adding a new type of lighting. And Oh, and lighting. Uh-huh. Like, Frog lights. Oh, 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 okay. So it's not like a new engine update where the engine works differently. It's like a oh. new object you can place that provides light. Yeah, well, they also okay. did Are something with the... Well, there's a green one, there's uh-huh. a purple one, and there's a yellow one. Oh, okay. Neat, neat. Yeah, so you could have some a little bit different colored lights. Is there a way to make colored lighting yet? Or uh, no. It's just torches are kind of like yellowy and yeah. redstone are kind of red and then that's it. Yeah, so hmm. purple oh, and is the a sea new lanterns. color. Sea lanterns are kind of a, li- a little bit blue. Are they blue or are they just kind of white? They're kind of, kind of, well, there's no colored lighting except for there's like white lighting well, I mean, and redstone. yellow. Redstone lamps have colored red, don't they? Or maybe they don't. It's more like a yellow. Hmm. All right. Interesting. Cool. Well, we can look forward to that. Yeah. Um, what are the games you've been playing? Well. Speaking of voxel games, you play some Townscaper? Yeah. That's it's, a pretty fun game. Yeah. I, I like how the blocks, like in Minecraft, whenever you place a block, when you place a voxel, it uh, is almost, it's almost always uh, not paying attention to the blocks around it. So like um, stairs, right? You place stairs and they'll like follow around corners. Mm-hmm. So if you place like two stairs on a corner, then you'll make like a corner stair yeah. or whatever. But other than that, 
Like most blocks don't care like what blocks are around them. Yeah. And in Townscaper, it's almost the opposite, right? It's like there's only one type of block you can place, but the block is completely contextual, right? Like if you've got things on top of each other, then it makes like towers. And if you have them next to each other, it makes pavements and all that stuff. So it's like, yeah. it's kind of the opposite. Whereas Minecraft has a ton of different voxels, but they're almost all context independent. Townscaper has just one kind of voxel, but it's totally context dependent. Pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that. It would be cool if they could have both, right? Like if yeah. we could have a game that had context dependent voxels, but also like a bunch of different types of voxels. I guess yeah. you can like change the color of the, the voxels in yeah. Townscaper. So that's kind of a different kind of voxel, but yeah, but then you it, not like, really. It's just yeah. a different color, right? And it's just like a solid, like it doesn't mix at all. Right. Yeah, yeah. You can't make a gradient. Yeah. It would be nice if, if the different colors had some in-game meaning, right? Like if yeah. uh, if you colored them black, then they were like, I don't know. Uh, Smiths? Smithy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And there's all like coal and, uh, you know, an industry and stuff. Yeah. And, and then if, if they were blue, it was like, a, I don't know. Like blue, a Jewelry green. store or something like that. Yeah, like blue could be jewelry and the green could be a greenhouse because There green. you go. Because plants. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. That'd be pretty fun. Yep. Well, maybe someday. Speaking of someday, how about the far future? A Voltron, Defender of the Universe or whatever it's called. What is it called these days? Yeah, it's Voltron, Defender of the Universe. It is? Oh, okay. Yeah. I got it right. First try. <laughs> no editing. So so how's that been? You've been, been now they great. finished that series a while ago, right? Yeah. And the ending is absolutely horrendous. <laughs> oh no. Not so great, huh? All right, well we no. won't talk about that then. Let's talk about the good parts. How far does it how far can you go before it starts getting horrendous? Well, when Shiro is gone, it's pretty horrendous because no one likes Keith. Which season is that? Um, I think it's parts of the third season. Okay. So and like season one and two, solid. Season three, maybe. Yeah, because And then after that, like don't bother. Yeah. Like, once I get to Earth, it's just like, it gets worse. <laughs> they it get gets... back to Earth and it's just like, Earth, why do we want to be here? We could go anywhere in the universe. We've got a, we used to have a giant ship until something happened. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Did they lose the, did they lose the lions? No, they lose the castle. Oh, okay. They still got Voltron, though. Otherwise, yeah. like, why would it even be Voltron anymore? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the story of Voltron without Voltron. <laughs> Floating in the infinite of Black Abyss. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So season one and two. So you've been watching it again? You rewatch it often? or? Yeah. I like to rewatch it. Like the bits with Shiro and when he's the pilot of the Black Lion and mm -hmm. stuff like that's that's the good stuff. That's pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Do you have to not watch it sometimes? Like when your baby sisters are awake? Yeah. <laughs> it's just like. Tell us about that. Well, so Gwen has nightmares and I don't blame her. Some of the parts are actually, if I were in her shoes, like that show is like a horror movie it's kind of intense yeah yeah it's kind of intense There's some uh very it's very vivid too right yeah. like all the characters are are stylized and all the lighting is like really bright and and high contrast yeah mm, not intense a, <laughs> intensity intensity of outer space well speaking of outer space being super intense uh, i played the everspace 2 demo uh Ooh. this past week and it was all right it was um, so have you ever played, uh, like a space game? I a tried. space game. Yeah, I tried the breakup ship game. Oh yeah, Shipbreaker. Yeah, but it hurt my brain so much. <laughs> Like, what hurt your brain about it? So like one time, like this is right side up, and then you t and then you turn around, oh. and then it's upside down. And you're just like, Wait, what? <laughs> what happened? Okay, so like not having an up and a down yeah. is really difficult to parse. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That is, it is a little bit disorienting. It's it's quite disorienting. Um, yeah, like so, a lo but a lot of games, a lot of space games are kind of they're not really space games. Like Kerbal, you've played per Kerbal Space Program, right? Yeah. And I so failed. Kerbal Space Program is like really a space game where it's like real physics and like real, you know, spaceships and like, you know, the rules of the universe apply in the ways that we recognize. Yes. But most space games are uh, like Everspace 2 are basically like zero gravity, but atmospheric fighters, but also like um, what, like almost like underwater. So it's almost like a submarine if water was like was like really fluid so that you could go really fast in it easily. Um, so it's, it's this weird thing where there's like planets floating in an ocean of aether or something like that, but they all present themselves as like realistic science fiction games or whatever. I mean, they don't, they don't usually say they're realistic, although Star Citizen does, which is just silly. Uh, but in Everspace 2, you're flying around as this, it's basically like World War II era, um, <laughs> tactics and stuff. So you've got these big freighters that fly around and then you've got these little tiny fighters that can, you know, fly around really fast and you've got missiles that they can kind of dodge. 
Um, cause like nowadays with modern stuff, it's very difficult to dodge missiles in a fighter. Like the missiles are so much more maneuverable than fighters than aircraft of any kind. And, um, but so in these games, it's kind of like World War II era kind of thing where fighters don't have super long range. So you have to have these capital ships that you land on. They've got carriers and stuff, uh, that kind of thing. Strafing runs and dog fights. Whereas like in space, you wouldn't ever be close enough to do a dog fight. Like all the weapons would be such long range because there's nothing in space to stop them. Right. So you'd just be anyway. Kind of Voltron. And there's like, yeah. Well, yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> in Voltron, you can have a dog fight. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's right. Like, yeah, it's like Voltron where, where you're flying around as if it was an airplane as opposed to flying as if it was a spaceship like in Kerbal Space Program. Yeah. We have to burn all the time to change directions. So anyway, it's it's a fun time. It was um, a little story heavy for me. They've got a bunch of these in-game... They're not in-game cutscenes. They're like illustrated cutscenes. So a lot of times you'll have like CGI pre-rendered cutscenes where they, they have it like a Pixar movie, right? Where it's all generated in the computer, but they render it beforehand and then they send it to you like as a movie so you could watch the movie. So it's called a cutscene where it cuts from gameplay into uh, this rendered scene and then it cuts back to gameplay. So these are cutscenes, but they're not like pre-rendered CGI cutscenes. They're like hand-drawn kind of animated cutscenes and they're not even really animated that much. It's, it's mostly stills with like a little bit of, of overlay movement. Um, so it's kind of interesting, like I'm sure it's much lower overhead so they can make them much more easily and they can make a lot more of them. Um, but also they lasted a long time and I felt like I wanted a fast forward button where I'm like, yeah, I know what's going on here. I don't want to miss anything, but I don't want to sit here and watch everything at like, you know, at this speed. And so it's like, yeah. there's, it's either skip the whole thing or like just sit here and watch it. And I'd like to be able to, you know, like in Kerbal Space Program, put on fast forward, right? Like time, time compression. Let's, you know, like skip through some of this part. So anyway, it was, it was all right. Uh, I don't I know remember. if I'm going to be picking up the full game, but yeah, hmm? Go ahead. I remember watching you play Kerbal Space Program and I was like, and I just <laughs> slowly nodding when I didn't <laughs> actually know what was going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's also that also can be a disorienting game because uh, you're transferring between different gravity wells and doing orbits and stuff, and a lot of it's kind of not intuitive. But anyway, Hyper uh, Everspace Two is very intuitive as far as controls because it's just like it, it is a six axis, so it feels a little bit like Descent. I don't know. You probably haven't played Descent, um, but it's one of the it's one of the first six axis shooter games where you can move mm. up and down, side to side, forward and backward, and then rotate on all the axes freely. And so Everspace 2 is like that, where it's a, a six-axis game. And they've got a lot of elements in there where they've um, they've got little scenarios, little uh, vignettes that they've set up. So there's you know, like an asteroid, and it's got um, a, a cargo container inside, but there's also some like mobs in there or something that you have to shoot. So it's like... it. In space, like, there's no reason not to just, like, go straight to a thing, but they've added some reasons not to go straight. So there's, like, big wrecks of cargo ships, and then you have to, like, fly through the cargo ship and get a thing, or you have to, like, go and get a power cell from somewhere and put in a power cell slot to open a door in the cargo ship. So they've, they've gone out of their way to make it interesting uh, without being outside the uh, the genre of space games. You know, all this is happening in space still, and there's beautiful nebulas and stuff like that. So it's, But it doesn't really feel like, after coming from, from Kerbal Space Program, uh, it doesn't really feel like a space space game so much as almost like a submarine game it's almost like mm. a submarine space game uh which most yeah. of these games are and and I mean, maybe that's more fun than actual real life space you know whatever what other game sort of hurt my head for a little bit yeah hyperbolica like, hyperbolica yeah yeah like the first one the farm mm -hmm. like it hurt my head so <laughs> bad well, that's, not, that's not the first one that's the that's a, like a separate part but oh. that's where you started we were all so we were all playing together uh, I started playing and then I got into the farm and you're like, can I play? I was like, all right, cool. Yeah, go for it. And so you got in there and it's just like spherical space. Everything wraps around on itself. <laughs> like my brain is just like, okay, so that's over there. Wait, no, it's over there. No, no, now it's, now it's over there. Now it's inside out above me. What? <laughs> That was the craziest thing is like you can be watching something and you back away from it and it slowly like grows larger and like wraps around and then it's behind you. It's like, what just happened? <laughs> where did it go? <laughs> How am I here? Or the well, right? Where you like drop in the well and you go through the center of the planet and you end up on the other side of the universe, right? But it's yeah. but you can see the well above you because you just came through it. Yeah, and then you're just like, huh? <laughs> what? Yeah, that's that's quite a trip. It's a little bit short. Like I was this I was kind story. of hoping for a little bit more gameplay, but yeah. I'm for what it was, it was it was quite an experience. It's just like, wow, this is the craziest dream I've ever had. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the hyperbolic space with like where the corners go off to infinity, right? 
That was really cool. Please do not go through the corners unless you want to go through space forever and ever and ever. Yeah. Well, you do get stuck eventually, right? Like your character is too wide to fit, but yeah. <clears throat> and then you turn around and you can see like six different cells in front of you, right? And they're all like squeezed in because you're in this hyperbolic corner. But then when you get into them, they're all like at right angles from each other. It's just like, yeah. what? This is crazy. Yeah. Crazy. I, I know they have VR support, and I'd be interested to see what it would be like to play that game in VR. Yeah, well, Uncle Ben has a VR. We could ask to buy it. There we go. Or we could go over to his place and load up some Hyperbolica, play it in VR. That'd be fun. The only thing I've played in VR is, like, Beat something. Beat Saber? Yeah. Beat Saber. And Beat Saber's a popular one. Yeah. I played Beat Saber, Saber, and uh, Job Simulator. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Had some fun time destroying other people's cars, because my boss told me to. <laughs> In the car, in the guard one. Yeah. The uh, what, auto mechanic. Yeah. Hmm. And he's just like, never ask what the, never ask what the dude is. Don't ask where they came from. Just go over and help them. And then this <laughs> bandit comes up and he's just like, um, I'm on the run. I mean, I need a, a camouflage to yada yada. And, like repaint this car or whatever. Yeah. Will you please repaint this car? Yeah. Ah, thanks. And could you m- remove the license plate? Ah, oh, thanks. <laughs> And he's just like, okay, nice. now I'll pay you back later, and um, because I'm on the run, I mean, I need to get somewhere very quickly. <laughs> and then there was this really emo kid, and he's just like, hey, I want to do some, like, vibes. Will you please, like, stick this honking horn into my gas thingy? What? The back, the gas. The exhaust pipe? Yeah, the exhaust pipe. Oh, okay. And then... Like it- a buzzer or something? Yeah. And then he's just like, nice, will you please, like, do some interior stuff? Huh. And I went over and I gave him a, one of the smell thingies. Smell good? Oh, yeah, yeah. Air freshener? Yeah. There you go. Hmm. Well, speaking of interior stuff, I've been playing NAND game this last week. Ooh. Someone in the comments at Seamus' blog on the last iCast episode mentioned uh, NAND game. I forget the, what the context was for that, but I looked into it and it is very cool. It is a game about building a computer from scratch, which is like from relays, like on and off relays that like a switch that you can turn on and off by turning the power on and off to it. Um, and so like you start with that and then you build a NAND gate. And then you build all the other logic gates with the NAND gate. And then you... Uh, what kind of city does do they have? And a gate? Gate. It's like a gate. It is like a gate, though, because it allows things... It opens and closes and allows things through. So in the in the case of a computer, it opens and closes and allows electrons to flow through. allows electricity through. Or not. It is kind of like a city, though. If you ever looked at a, a computer chip, and yeah. there's all those little pathways, right? It is kind of yeah. like a city. I, I would go over and I'd be like, okay, daddy, look. See, that's the store. And that's the yeah. houses. And that's the road. And that's the warehouse houses <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so it is kind of like a city and the gates are it's a metaphor that works because we're familiar with cities and that computers kind of work like cities so uh i did have some trouble with the full adder when i was going because like you start off with gates and then you're doing logic operations you're trying to build the logic operations Uh-oh. and then you're combining the logic operations into um into functional units and so when you first go from from logic to math, because the full adder is basically doing math and a half adder is almost just doing logic. And so like going from between those two, I just had, for whatever reason, I had a lot of trouble with the with the full adder. And I think it was because it was it was dealing with math. And it was the first time when you really had to like think about it as a math problem and not as a logic problem. Yeah, and, I don't think I'd like be very good at that. Switching. Yeah, well, I, I was never good at arithmetic either, but just like switching modes there, like trying to trying to get out of the logic because I've been doing the logic thing for a while for several puzzles and then like oh I gotta get into math and like oh it was it was difficult because I was you know like switching over to that other mechanical the mental machinery right like yeah. getting like getting disengaged from the logic thing and like engaging with the the math uh, machinery was mm. was a trick um, and then the latch was difficult because I had did the latch problem in my college uh, logic class, um, uh, computer logic. And so we were using AND gates and NOR gates and all that stuff and building things. And the latch, I'd, I'd solved it before and I knew there was a really elegant solution with like two logic units that you could do and you like loop one back into the other and then it would connect it up. And like I knew there was a way to do it, 
but I couldn't remember how to do it. And so I kept trying to like you're combine like, two logic gates in different ways. And it was just, it wasn't working. So I finally gave up. And, and you're just like, Grendel, <laughs> I'm, I'm trusting in you. <laughs> well, no, I, I was trying to, I was trying to solve the problem because I, I was having trouble solving the problem because I didn't want to look up the solution, but I remembered, I was trying to look up the solution in my memory, right? I was like, oh, somewhere in my memory is the solution to this problem. And I'm pretty sure I can get to it, but I couldn't get to it. So I finally kind of fiddled around and, and solved it just in the normal way of like figuring out how to get things to do. And it does have some looping back on itself, which is, is pretty cool. The latch, I don't think I got, uh, I got the optimal solution for that, but, um, and then, so then you build all these logic units and then once you have all the logic units, you start programming. And first you're just programming in binary, which is really cool because you built this whole processor and this whole memory retrieval system all from, from components. And then it's like, okay, well, now here's the memory addresses. And this thing is going to grab the, you know, it's going to use these bits to grab the memory. And it's going to use these bits to grab the, the, um, the values in the memory. And it's like going to go on the stack and going to go to these different pointers. And it's like, whoa, that's really cool. And so then you start doing a higher level, um, programming language you start writing an assembler i think is where this was no no this was higher level than that it was it was above assembler so it was like a, a higher level programming language um and you're building a parser so it'll take the the characters that are in the computer that you're putting in the in the character recognition system and break them apart into a syntax tree and then uh evaluate all the expressions and the the thing that really annoyed me was that the expressions when they when they have expressions in the in the programming syntax parser uh the way that they number the expressions is from one and everything else in the game is indexed from zero and so it was just like why did you do this because i was trying to solve the problem and it's like everything's working fine everything's working fine and then this thing i was just stuck on it i was like why is this not working and it doesn't really give you helpful debugging or anything it just expects you to know that it's supposed to be indexed from one and so i was indexing everything from zero and i was like all right well maybe i have to index from one i guess i'll just try it and it worked it was like oh no why so that was that was quite annoying whoa it's me <laughs> whoa is me there's one index instead of zero indexing so zero out of ten would not play again actually it wasn't bad uh and then the push value macro doesn't work for negative numbers or something there was a weird thing where you could write a macro and it was supposed to take a number but the numbers that it was accepting if it got into negative numbers or if it got higher than like 1024 then it would just return a value of 12 instead like it would store a value of 12 into the into the heap or to the um the stack uh, so that was very confusing. So I ended up just like writing my own push value thing instead of using the push value macro. Cause like, I know how to do it. Cause I already did it in the previous puzzle. And then I got as far as the bonus questions and got through a few of them. But when I get to multiplication, I, it was like, oh, this is going to be a nightmare. Uh, I'm done. <laughs> so, so I'm done with that game for like now. It's just like one out of 4 million. Well, it's 16 bit. You're supposed to be doing 16 bit multiplication. And I was like, oh, I could do this brute force by hooking up 16 full adders and then like, or and bit shift operations, right? And like hooking a bunch of switches and a bunch of bit shift operations. And it's like, I know there's got to be a more optimal solution and I could look it up. And like the best thing to do at this point is just to look up what the solution is, but I didn't want to do that. And so I was just like, eh, I, I give up, All right? Like this is, this is the limit of my, my patience for, for this kind of puzzle. Um, but speaking of games where you are working with language and like trying to figure out what to type into the computer. Yeah. And like puzzles and, stuff. and puzzles and stuff. Scribble Knots Unlimited. Yeah. That game is great. I made a zoo and then I turned some people into dogs. <laughs> <laughs> now you've played through several times, right? Have you beat the game several times now? Yes. I beat it like twice. Twice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's more than I have. I've only beat it once. It's And then afterwards, I built this amazing zoo. Mm. It was splendid. Which, uh, which zone was that in? It was, well... Is it the city? Uh, No, I actually made it in the castle. In the castle? Okay. Yeah. In the towers and stuff. Mm. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I turned the wizard's tower into a forest. <laughs> and jungle. <laughs> Sorry, Harry, but... um. The year I've, I've moved the Forbidden Forest into your room. <laughs> Gryffindor Tower is now the Forbidden Forest. <laughs> until further notice. <laughs> All Gryffindors must move into another dormitory. <laughs> Everyone's moving to Hagrid's house. <laughs> and then Hagrid's just like, okay, you can go here and you can go there. So what do you like best about Scribble Knots Unlimited? Um, I like the 
freedom that I had. Mm, yeah, yeah. It has a lot of options. It recognizes a lot of different words. It's just like, and I type in, I'm just like, okay, I'll type in this number, this thing. And it's just like, oh, you spelled it wrong. And then there's long five page lists <laughs> of all the things that it could possibly be. <laughs> and I'm just like, how did they have make all of this stuff? It's pretty good at, it's pretty good at, at, uh, at helping you learn to, to spell, isn't it? Has your spelling improved from playing Scroll Lots Unlimited? Well, <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, a good, bit. good. I but mean, it, like, it must have a, a little bit. But I still write mean were wrong sometimes. Like Mean? Yeah, like, I mean. Oh, I yeah, didn't because mean synonyms. to hurt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. just yeah. like. M-E-A-N versus M. E-E-N. E-E-N. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Homonyms. Homophones? Homophones? Homophones. <laughs> Words that sound the same, but mean different things. Da-da. Hmm. Scriminauts Unlimited. Good stuff. Do you have any of the games you want to talk about, or do you go to the mailbag? Ah, uh, well. Let's, for a moment, let's go back to Minecraft. So, yeah, yeah. So, so like, um, Anne Reed, and she brought up this, and she's just like, you make this thing into, uh, you make a cake on this table. And I'm just like, yes, because the crafting table isn't a crafting table. It's a magical table. <laughs> it's kind of a magical table, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the magic table that you make all your things in. Mm-hmm. Mm. Same thing with the furnace. Like, here, I'll plop a, a like square a meter into this tiny, into this square meter furnace. Cubic meter, yeah. And then it's going to go over and it's going to make me a square, a cubic, cubic meter of glass. <laughs> or a whole stack of cubic meters of glass, right? Plop, uh, plop a piece of lava in there or something. Yeah. Magma. Bucket of magma. Yeah. Bucket of lava. Yeah. They had a powder snow. Powder oh, yeah? snow? Yeah. What does that do? Um, well, if you, it's, it sinks you down, and if you stand in it for too long, then your hearts become, become like a... Frozen? You become Anna, basically, and you freeze. Slowly. You freeze? You're frozen? Yeah. Can you not... Is It makes you move slower, or... Yeah, it makes you move slower, and you can't jump out of it. Oh. So if you fall you in, like, a... have to mine your way in, out of it, maybe? Yeah, you can. But if you're in adventure mode... Mmm, then you're in trouble. Yeah. You're not really playing Minecraft if you're in adventure mode, though. Like, yeah. you can't mine, and you can't craft. Can you craft in adventure mode? You can. Okay. All right. So mm. it's like, I have taken all the meaning out of mine and craft. <laughs> Spectator know? mode. No mining, no crafting. <laughs> all right. We're going to have to wrap this up. Okay. Let's see. Mailbag here. time. Okay. So this is a question uh, from Nick. Nick sent in like six questions. And so I'm going to try to answer the one that he sent that was just for me while Seamus isn't here so that he doesn't have to sit here and listen to me explaining it to him. So you can sit here and ex listen to me explain it to you. Okay. Dur Dipcast. Hi, Paul. Of all your experiences as a freelance 3D modeler, if that description is accurate, it is, what is the most interesting slash unusual request you have been commissioned to produce or the most interesting slash unusual intent for your finished product? Yours geometrically, Nick. So, uh, I have been doing 3D modeling. I've been doing it pretty seriously, I guess, for about 10 years now. Um, and you, you've seen me doing, like, commissions yeah. and stuff. Yeah, I, re I remember the one where you're making, making ash, and then you made papyrus for me and stuff. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then you made those those two girl anime things. Yeah, well, I, a lot of those were... Okay, so so uh, if you guys want to see people in the podcast or whatever, want to uh, see some of the stuff I do, go to 3D.tryop.com. That's 3D.tryop.com. And there's like a whole gallery of stuff there. Uh, you know, a bunch of little previews of things and links to all of the different stuff. Um, so you can look at that. Uh, I think that... So there's kind of a range of, of clients... Uh, just describing what normal is. There's like the client who has no idea about 3D modeling. Um, and that's the kind of client who asks for a 3D JPEG <laughs> where they're like, they know so little about it that they don't even know what kind of for file format supports 3D content. Um, so those guys can, can be really fun to work with. Cause they're just like, Hey, look, I've got this JPEG. Can you make it into a 3D JPEG? It's like, yeah, I can do that. Or they can be like, Hey, I want like this, uh, you to have like, make a game out of this thing that I made. Like that's a 3D thing, right? And it's like, yeah, but it's like huge amount of work. Like they just have no concept of, of like what's involved. So, um, a lot of these guys just want to be able to 3D print something. And that's really easy because I know how to make a model for 3D printing and I can give it to them in a format that'll work. And then it's just like done. Um, so then there's like, 
the the guys who do know kind of what they want, but they don't realize how much work they're asking for. So like I've got at least two people ask me to make all the 3D models for an entire game. Like one of them was like a full conversion of GTA into a, like a Batman game. And one of them was um, somebody wanted to make like a real time strategy on Mars game or like a, a city builder or whatever. And they needed like a ton of models. And um, and he had listed out like every single one of the models. He's like, you know, I need this many of this model and this many of that model and this many trucks and this many, you know, this kind of building and that kind of building. And uh, I was like, OK, like it's going to be ten thousand dollars for all this modeling. And uh, it never got back to me. Right. Because it's just like, oh, well, I don't have the budget for that. Like, you know, I thought you were going to do it for free or something. So, yeah, uh, I found out recently that. A lot of old, like, old grandmas are just like, I want you to remodel my bathroom. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've been doing some commission, uh, some commission uh, contracting. And, uh, yeah, it's the same thing in real life. A lot of people don't realize how much work's involved in something. So, um, that, there were some, there did some, I have done some things where I was working on a game that, uh, specifically Minecraft, that was like, I know exactly how much work is involved in this. And for games, it makes so much more sense to do procedural modeling, like I did with Minecraft, because then you, instead of making like 300 different varieties of trees, you just make one piece of code that can make an infinite variety of trees. Ta-da. And then, uh, and then you don't have to model them all specifically and they can uh, be adapted really easily to the environment. So like the, the big trees in Minecraft that I coded, the branches check to see about their surroundings and they won't like make branches into cliffs and things like that. And uh, so it's like, it's really, it's really nice to be able to work with procedural stuff. Although most clients don't really want uh, procedural modeling. And then um, the, I think the most fun, like as far as uh, interesting for me is when I have a client who want, who has zero reference and they're like, Hey, I've just got this short sentence of what I want. Can you make this? And, uh, it's, that's really interesting because now I have to kind of get into their headspace and be like, okay, what is it that they're looking for? Cause there's so many ways you can interpret their description. And, uh, there was one client, the, the Bulgari, it's like this uh, little spirally sphere thing. And he came to me with this description of like, I want like a, an oval shaped sphere. I, I I'm not going to try to recreate it. Um, but he gave me this really short description. And so I was like, I think I know what he's talking about. And like, I made this 3d model. And I'm like, is this what you're talking about? And he's like, oh my goodness, that's exactly what I was talking about. How did you know? And I was just like, I'm so happy I got that right. And he's like, I'm so happy I found you. And we're like, yay. <laughs> so that was awesome. Hey, you know what this calls for? A party. A party. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So zero reference modeling. I think for like, as far as other people, most interesting that, that other people might find interesting is um, up existing game models. So in video games, they'll make a high... Sometimes they'll make a high poly version and bake it down to a low poly. Sometimes they'll just make a low poly version and then put high poly, high res textures on it. So the, the 3D geometry never really existed. It was just like this texture map that they put on top of it, like painting a wall, right? If you paint a wall to look like stone, the wall was never made of stone, right? You just painted it to look that way. But then someone will come to me and they're like, hey, can you take this video game wall? They've never asked me for a wall, but like this video game wall and like actually make it so that it's actually made of stone, like model all the stones and stuff and make it into geometry so I can 3D print it or so mm. I can use it in another game or whatever or for renders. Yeah. And uh, so that's up resing. And those end up looking really cool because... I'm starting with geometry, uh, like a, a base model, so I don't have to like work on that. So I can focus all my efforts on just like getting the detail in the texture maps into reality and like make it real mm. geometry. And uh, so I think those look really, really cool because you can see all the details in the geometry and from the texture map and uh, it turns out really well. So like interesting, as far as interesting to other people, that's probably where it's at. Um, then like as far as projects that like turned out really cool, interesting finished product, uh, there was a client I had who wanted to make a replica of the sunshot from Destiny 2. And it's this gun. It's, it's uh, I think maybe you saw the video. I can put a link in the in the video to the video I made showing off the video that he made along with the making of that I made. But it's this very mm. intricate uh, gun. And he wanted it to be able to actually open like it does in the game. Like the cylinder pops out so that you can you pull the cylinder off and like replace it with a new ammo cartridge or whatever. Speaking of... 3D models mm-hmm. that you were asked to make. What about your good robot? Thing? Yeah, that's true. I, I did make some good robot stuff. I wasn't commissioned to do that. It was just kind of something I did because I wanted to. 
Um, but I'm really happy with how that turned out. And that's probably the animation that I've done that I'm the most proud of. I um, remember like watching you, you and mom play together. And I'm just mm. like, whoa, they are <laughs> really bonded. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's really good to, to play good robot with two people. Cause one person can just focus on the movement and one person can just focus on the shooting. And that way you can like the person who's moving could just dodge everything all the time. And the person who's shooting could just like prioritize targets. So, uh, yeah, I, I feel like two player on, you know, hot seat, like sitting on the same computer computer uh playing good robot is is the way is where it's at is but, the um, way to go but then as far as like unusual um the most unusual by far kind of combines all these elements it was a client who came to me wanting an asset for a game that he uh, he didn't have any reference for but he had like a previous game he had made and it was a horror game and the only reference he had was that he wanted Jim Carrey's face on the monster somewhere. Because, like, for whatever reason, he had, he had like, made Jim Carrey, like, the villain in the previous game. And so it was just, like, it was this wide open thing, but also, like, this very strange thing. And so, like, so I did it. I made this, this reference art for, like, I made a sketch of, like, is this kind of what you want? Or, like, a few different sketches. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that, that's the idea. And so I, I, like, did a detailed sketch. I'm like, is this what you're looking for? And he's like, yeah, that's perfect. And so I was like, okay. So I modeled the whole thing up, 3D modeled it. And then I was like, all right, well, here's, like, a render. And then he, he wanted some animation. So I'm like, here's the render. And, like, let me know what kind of animations you want. And I didn't hear back from him for, like, three months. And then he got back to me and he's like, oh, sorry, I'd been in the hospital. Like, I was playing Portal 2 and I got this blood clot in my leg and almost died. But don't worry. <laughs> I'll have my brother pay you if I end up dying. And I was just like, uh, what? Like, this is, your priority is a little off, man. <laughs> so it's like this horror game that turned into a real life horror. And uh, so I never ended up doing the animations because he never got back to me on, on like the frame rate and how fast he wanted him and how long he wanted him to last and the format he wanted him. And like, there were a bunch of details to work out. And uh, it, it never came, ended up coming together. But yeah, what a weird project. I think I might still have those files somewhere. I could I could dig them up. Maybe uh, maybe I'll put a render up on the screen if, if you guys want to see. Because I never got paid for it. So my policy is, if I do a commission for you and you don't pay me, I get to do whatever I want with the model. If you do pay me for it, then probably I won't like put it up for free anywhere because you paid me for it. And so like the idea is that you should have uh, privileged access to that. Um, but yeah, that was that was certainly the weirdest project I've ever worked on by far. And I guess that brings us to the end of the diecast. Thanks so much for being here. And thank you, everybody who's sending questions. We have tons of questions in the mailbag. Most of them uh, are about or addressed to Seamus mostly, so I'm not going to address them right now. But continue to send them to diecast at SeamusYoung.com. And we will hopefully be back with Seamus next week. Say goodbye, Leia. Bye-bye.